Good evening. I'm Amy Lizer, and I'm the executive director of the Monroe County Historical Association, and I'd like to welcome you to our third Thursday lecture series. Now on your screen, you will find a menu bar that can, has controls at the bottom uh, for you to submit questions via the Q&A function. And we ask you to use this button to post all of your questions for tonight's speaker. Posting the questions in the Q&A helps us keep track of them during the presentation. Now questions can be asked at any time throughout the presentation, but will be answered following the program. Speaking of which, let's get to it. I am delighted to introduce Rick Smith. Rick is a local historian and a Pocono native. He's graduated from Pocono Mountain High School and Wilkes University. And after 44 years of employment, Smith retired from Sanofi Pasteur. He's also served as a Pocono Mountain School director for 23 years. Smith and his wife Kelly live in Jackson Township, and he became interested in the writings of Edgar Allan Poe as a youngster and has always enjoyed sharing Poe's story with others. Thank you so much for joining us today, Rick. Well, thank you for having me. <clears throat> I think this is a wonderful topic. It's certainly very seasonally appropriate. Everyone thinks about Poe in the month of October, I think. I believe so. Hi, yes. sir. <laughs> yes, me too. Um, and actually something we wanted to include for tonight's viewers uh, using that Q&A, and we know that it's not actually a question, we thought it'd be really fun if you would type in, what was your favorite work by Poe? and we can discuss it at, after the program today. So uh, feel free to go ahead and add that if you'd like. And without any further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Rick. It's all yours, thank you. Thank you, Amy. <clears throat> I'm very happy to be here. And uh, you just told me a few minutes ago that this is the last one for the season. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm happy to put a, a bookmark at the end of this season with Edgar Allan Poe. So let's get started. I think everyone recognizes these first couple of lines from his famous, his famous poem, The Raven. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lure. And, and that's about where it ends for most people. They don't remember the rest of it. I mean, they remember it when it's read to them or after they see it in writing, but, but uh, it, it is a wonderful poem. It's, it's actually my favorite, I, if I have to vote on that right away. And when we talk about Edgar Allan Poe, most people uh, he, know him. He's best known for his tales of psychological terror. He was known in his own time, though, for satire and mystery, literary criticism, and lyrical poetry. He worked as an editor for several newspapers and magazines. And he's perhaps the best known author of short stories and tales of, of the mystery of mystery and the macabre. I have to stop at this point and tell you that that my, my uh, first recollection of reading Poe was, was in uh, junior high school. My uh, literature teacher in Pocono Mountain was uh, Mrs. Wonder, and she uh, introduced us to Poe. We probably read four or five of his short stories and, of course, uh, The Raven. And then we had a, a whole semester of reading other, other authors and other short stories. And to be honest with you, I don't remember any of them but I remember everything that she told us about Poe. So it, it, uh, if it's introduced at an early age and, and you're uh, so inclined to uh, love that type of, uh, of literature, it stays with you. So Poe is considered the inventor of detection fi fiction and also he contributed to the emerging genre of science fiction. He was uh, born in Boston on January 19th, 1809. He was the second of three children of actors David and Elizabeth, but she went by Eliza Poe. The father abandoned the family in 1810, and the mother died in 1811. So when he was only between two and three years old, he was an orphan already. The three children at that point were split up, and his older brother, William Henry Leonard Poe, uh, went to live with the paternal, his paternal grandparents. Oddly enough, their names were David and Elizabeth Poe also. His younger sister, Rosalie Poe, uh, went to live with William and Jane Mackenzie in Richmond, Virginia. And she took on the name 
uh, uh, she took on the name Mackenzie, so she became Rosalie Mackenzie Pope. Edgar went to live with John and Francis Allen in Richmond, Virginia. So the three kids were split up. Two of them were in Richmond, but they very seldom saw each other. And uh, he was never formally adopted by the Allen family, but he did add Allen to his name and from there on became Edgar Allen Poe. Poe began writing poems at an early age and was ready to publish his first collection of poems by the age of 13, but was discouraged by his stepfather. He had said he had to wait until he was 18. Now, I don't know if, if uh, many of you have kids out there I can tell you that mine were not ready to publish anything at age 13. So you can tell he was, he was a bit of a, a child prodigy when it came to, uh, to writing. At 18, he was still very young by the standards of the day. His contemporaries, Longfellow was first published at age 32 and Emerson at 33 and Charles Dickens at 24. So by their standards, he was still very young although he was ready to publish five years even before that. Uh, he was engaged to Sarah Elmira Royster before he he enrolled in the University of Virginia at age 17, where he studied ancient and modern languages. So he, he went to the University of Virginia, which had only o just opened about uh, seven years before he, he uh, went there. So it was in its infancy, really. It was founded by Thomas Jefferson, and the university had very strict rules against gambling, horses, guns, tobacco, alcohol, all the things that he felt were pretty fun. Uh, and he often ignored those rules. Uh, he, he ignored them to the point of, if he actually had gambling debts in his first year of college of about $2,400, which was an astronomical figure in those days. And he was cut off from the Allen family because of his gambling debts and was told that he couldn't return to the university after that first year. But he didn't go back to Richmond with them. He learned that Miss Royster had married another man, so he didn't see any reason to go back to, to Richmond. He moved on to Boston, where he took odd jobs as a clerk and newspaper writer. He wrote several articles under the assumed name of Henri Le René during the time. Uh, it's believed that he used Henri, which is actually the French version of Henry. His, his older brother's name was Henry, so he, he was kind of taking his older brother's name and putting it to his work. Uh, he was unable to continue to support himself, so he enlisted in the U.S. Army at the age of 18 using the name Edgar A. Perry, claiming that he was 22 years old. You're going to see, and I'll, I'm going to remind you a couple of times about the different names that he used throughout his career, and, and uh, it wasn't until very later in his, in his life that he actually started using his own name. He served at the fort in Boston Harbor for $5 a month, an astronomical figure, I suppose, for those days. He released his first book, a 40-page collection of poetry titled Tamerlane and Other Poems. And again, he used the byline by a Bostonian. It didn't, he did not credit himself for this. So this was a paperback book that was first put out. 50, only 50 copies were printed and 12 have survived to this day. Now that's, that's, pretty, that's a pretty uh, remarkable feat because most paperbacks, uh, at least today, just get thrown away or, or uh, recycled or something. But to have 12 survive is really a, a great feat. And the most recent copy was sold at auction at the Christie's Auction Gallery in New York for a sum of 662,500. So if you, if you want, go, uh, you can stop the, uh, the uh, lecture right now and go look and see if you have one of these in your attic. He reached the rank of Sergeant Major for artillery, the highest rank that he could achieve as an enlisted man. He left the army early after finding a replacement to complete his term. This was, this was not an odd thing for in those days. You may remember that uh, Abraham Lincoln, rather than go into the army during the Civil War, he had a, a, a replacement to go in for him who was from Stroud Township. And the uh, Monroe County Historical Society has a, a placard along uh, West Main Street indicating that John Somerville Staples uh, did this for Abraham Lincoln. So Poe moved to Baltimore to stay with his aunt and her young daughter and other relatives. And during his time in Baltimore, he published his second book, Alla Roof, Tamerlane and Minor Poems. 
He then traveled to West Point and entered the service as a cadet in 1830. Remember, he just left the service finding a replacement, and now he went back in as, as a cadet to be an officer. He, but he left after purposely getting court-martialed for gross neglect of duty, disobedience of orders, and refusing to attend formations, classes, and church. So you, you can see he didn't stick with things for very long. He, he has a history also of, of starting things that he doesn't really finish. <clears throat> While there at, uh, in, in the West Point, though, he began writing satirical poems about his commanding officers, and he took donations of 75 cents from his fellow soldiers to publish his third book, simply titled Poems. He did use his own name on this one. He was determined to live solely from his income as a writer, and he did, although he never lived very well. In fact, he offered Graham's magazine his poem, The Raven, but he was turned down. Graham gave Poe $15 as an act of charity because he viewed the poem as a cry for help. The next month, however, Poe sold the Raven to the American Review for $9. They published the poem under the name Quarles. Again, he didn't use his own name. He was fiercely critical of his fellow writers and earned the name Tomahawk Man. He had an ongoing feud with two of his famous contemporaries, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow and Ralph Waldo Emerson, at one point accusing them both of plagiarism. However, he had deep respect for other writers and corresponded with Elizabeth Barrett Browning and Charles Dickens. So I'm gonna just stop for a minute and give you some Poe trivia. The Ravens, Baltimore's professional NFL team is named after his famous bird. You might, you might not know this, but the Baltimore actually had an NFL team called the Colts. And in 1984, they moved to Indianapolis and they went for 11 years without having a team in Baltimore. And they, they were very upset about this. The people in the town were very upset. They wanted an, another NFL team. So there was a team in Cleveland, the Cleveland Browns, that they were having some financial difficulties. And the owner of the Browns, decided to move to Baltimore because they promised him a new stadium. He wanted to call it the Baltimore Browns. And of course, they went to court. Cleveland said, no, you can't take the Browns name. You can take the team, but you can't have the name because we're going to have another Browns team eventually. So there was a contest and fans actually chose the name. There were 17 names submitted and it boiled down to a fan favorite of the Baltimore Ravens. And they did that because of Poe's association with the town having been buried there and also his, uh, his famous uh, bird, the raven. And as I've said, he's, he's used many, many names throughout his career, including Edward, a, Edward, I'm sorry, Edgar A. Perry, Henri Le René, Quarles, and a Bostonian. He married his first cousin, Virginia Eliza Clem. Remember I said that he went back to Baltimore to live with his aunt and her daughter and other relatives. Well, one of those, his, the daughter was Virginia Eliza Clem. And uh, he married her when she was just 13 years old. He was 26. Uh, they had a very, very good relationship, but she suffered from tuberculosis for five years before dying at the young age of 24. She's believed to be the inspiration behind Poe characters, Annabelle Lee, Lenore, Eleonora, and Ligia. The watercolor, watercolor that you see here is the only known portrait of Virginia. It was painted several hours after her death. Another famous American writer is Ray Bradbury. You might remember him from his famous novel Fahrenheit 451. Uh, Ray Brad, Bradbury has a famous, uh, his favorite Poe story. It's, uh, it's about the uh, Poe's only novel was the narrative of Arthur Golden Pym of Nantucket. It was about a boat capsizing and the crew drew straws to determine who would be eaten. Richard Parker drew the short straw and was killed and eaten by the surviving crew members. Initially, the book was not a success and critics did not believe Poe when he said it was a true story. And in fact, it was not true. But five years later, a boat did wreck and one of the crew was named Richard Parker. However, there was no cannibalism. And then in 19, I'm sorry, 1884, many years after Poe's death, another shipwreck occurred 
one of the crew members was cannibalized and his name was Richard Parker. And this, this always stuck with Ray Bradbury and said that's his, that's his famous post, his favorite Poe story. Poe had a favorite cat, Katarina, a tortoise shell cat, and it sat on his shoulder while he wrote. Uh, I, often, I often thought about this when I, when I heard that the first time. I thought, how could anyone actually accomplish anything with a cat sitting on your shoulder all day? Until my son told me, and my son is an artist, and he told me that uh, very often as he's doing his artwork at his desk, his cat sits on his shoulder. So I guess it can happen. Uh, within hours of Poe's death in 1849, Katerina, his cat, also died. The Poe Museum in Richmond is home to two black cats, Edgar and Pluto. Edgar, of course, named for the author himself, and Pluto is the name of the cat in his famous short story, The Black Cat. Poe loved to pull off hoaxes on the unsuspecting public. He had he authored six hoaxes and seemed to enjoy his attempts to fool the public. The first hoax appeared in the Southern Literary Messenger in 1835, and it was entitled The Unparalleled Adventure of One Hans Fall. It was supposedly the text of a note dropped by a hot air balloon over Rotterdam, written by Hans Fall. The text recounted his journey to the moon and, es and his moon to escape predators on Earth. <clears throat> Fall claimed he lived on the moon for five years with its lunar inhabitants. But Fall sent one of those inhabitants back to Earth with a promise that he'd tell his story if the creditors agreed to forgive his debt. His lunar friend became spooked, panicked, and dropped the note, then fled back to the moon. Of course, no one believed the story, and Poe himself admitted that the tone of mere banter rendered it less than credible. He had another hoax, the Great Balloon Hoax, and this was, he considered his best prank. It appeared in the midday issue of the New York Sun on April 13, 1844, in, including a, an announcement that, na that famed European balloonist Thomas Monk Mason had just completed a transatlantic journey in his balloon, the Victoria. The ad said Mason had departed from England, bound for Paris, but a propeller accident pushed him off course. The ad claimed he made the trip in just three days using coal gas rather than helium or hydrogen to fill the balloon. There was such a clamor for this story that it, generated, it quickly became unmanageable. Poe and the paper revealed it was just a hoax, but the story provided an inspiration for Jules Verne, a great Poe fan, to write five weeks in a balloon and around the world in 80 days. Poe is planning to travel to Philadelphia to edit a book of poetry for Mrs. M. St. Leon Loud. He appeared to be ill and was advised to see a doctor before traveling. His friend, Dr. John Carter, felt that felt Poe was too ill to travel and advised him to stay in Richmond. A week later, Poe found himself in Baltimore at Ryan's Fourth Ward polling house on the day of an election. He was in severe distress, disheveled, and dressed in someone else's clothes. He was taken to the church home and hospital where he died four days later. While in the hospital, he suffered feverish hallucinations and repeatedly called out for an unknown person named Reynolds. Now they have no idea who Reynolds was. No one uh, of his, his uh, acquaintances knew anyone named Reynolds. His family didn't know anyone by that name. And to this day, they don't really know who Reynolds was. <clears throat> Rumors circulated that Poe had been cooped. Cooping was a form of voter fraud where unsuspecting individuals were drugged and forced to vote at one polling place after another until they were left on the streets exhausted or dead. Now, it's odd that we haven't heard of cooping with all of the, the claims of voter fraud and everything that uh, have been surfaced in the last few years but they haven't talked about cooping at all. So that's a new one for me. It has been reported that in some cases, these people voted more than once, even at the same location, dressed in different clothing. This is a, uh, a cartoon that appeared in one of the newspapers that uh, shows two politicians uh, grabbing this uh, gentleman that looks to be a little inebriated 
leading him perhaps to uh, to vote at a at a polling place that was uh, not known to him. Following his death, Poe's obituary was written by Rufus Wilmot Griswold, a rival writer and sworn enemy of Poe. Poe had been highly critical of Griswold's writing ability. Griswold wrote the lengthy libelous obituary under a fake name. The obituary portrayed Poe as a mad, drunken, womanizing opium addict who wrote his dark tales from personal experience and died while on one of his many drinking binges. And this is, this is the portrayal of Poe that we have, have up until almost uh, maybe 1960 was what people really always believed Poe to be, a mad, drunken opium addict, and, and that all of his work was, was done while in some stupor. Uh, it's, only, it's only in the last 40 or 50 years, really, that we have uh, a, different, a different opinion of Poe. Part of his obituary uh, reads, Edgar Allan Poe is dead. He died in Baltimore the day before yesterday. This announcement will startle many, but few will be grieved by it. The poet was well known in all this country. He had readers in England and in several states of continental Europe, but he had few or no friends. The regrets for his death will be suggested principally by the consideration that in him literary art lost one of its most brilliant but erratic stars. He walked the streets in madness or melancholy with lips moving in indistinct curses or with eyes upturned in passionate prayers for the happiness of those who at that moment were objects of his idolatry, but never for himself, for he felt or professed to feel that he was already damned. We must omit any particular criticism of Mr. Poe's works as a writer of tales, it will be admitted generally that he was scarcely surpassed in ingenuity of construction or effective painting. As a critic, he was more remarkable as a dissector of sentences than as a commentator upon ideas. He was little better than a carping grammarian. Of his Raven, it is the most effective single example of fugitive poetry ever published in this country and is unsurpassed in English poetry for subtle conceptions, masterful ingenuity of versification, and consistent sustaining of imaginative lift. After life's fitful fever, he sleeps well. And of course, it was signed by Ludwig, not his real name. The picture you see here is a statue <clears throat> near his birthplace in, in uh, Boston, and it depicts Poe and his famous raven bird. Poe's attending physician, John Moran, wrote articles and eventually a book in defense of Poe to refute the rumors and to give his own first-hand first account of Poe's final days. Griswold's distorted opinion of Poe became the basis of public opinion until the mid-20th century. While lying in state, many people clipped hair from his corpse as souvenirs, which was a popular uh, pastime during the Victorian times. There are many theories about Poe's death. It's not really known exactly how he died or, or what caused his death, but there are many theories. Of course, we just talked about cooping. Uh, some people said, well, he just, it wasn't really anything other than just a beating that he took, but they, they never could understand why he was in someone else's clothing. Of course, he was also, uh, he had from time to time been, uh, it was rumored that he was a terrible alcoholic or drunk. Although they do know now that he suffered from a, from a, uh, a, a disease that uh, as, as few as one or two drinks rendered him in a stupor, an alcoholic stupor. So he, he was probably viewed to be an alcoholic even though he didn't drink much. Uh, it was also suggested that he may have been uh, subject to uh, carbon monoxide poisoning, uh, heavy metal poisoning, one of the, the theories also was that he suffered from rabies, and that's what caused his, his um, all, all of the uh, terrors while he was in the hospital. But the nurses at the time, this was brought up even at, at the time of his death, and the nurses said, no, he's still drinking water. He won't eat, but he still takes water. And, and anybody at the time that they knew who had rabies would, would be really against anything to do with water. <laughs> 
It's also been suggested that he had a brain tumor. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in, in a couple of slides. Uh, and some, some people said, well, he simply had a, a bad case of influenza which turned into pneumonia and that's what caused his death. And then there was also the rumor of murder. Murder because he had, remember in the, one of the first slides I told you that he was engaged to a Miss Royster. Well, she came back into his life and they were about to be married in, in seven days from the point of his death. And it was rumored that her father who hated Poe and didn't feel that he would be a good provider for his daughter, sent someone to Baltimore to murder him before the wedding could take place. So that's never been proven. It was never even, no charges were ever brought. It's just another one of the theories about Poe's death. He was hastily buried in an unmarked grave in his grandfather's plot in Westminster burying grounds in Baltimore. And it wasn't until 1913 that Oren Painter funded a headstone to be placed on his grave to mark his actual burial location. Years later, Poe's remains were moved to a new location in the same cemetery with enough space to relocate his wife, Virginia's remains, as well as his aunt, uh, Maria Clem. While moving Poe to his new burial site, burial site, the wooden coffin was damaged and pieces were dislodged and they were quickly recovered as souvenirs. It was also stated by one of the, uh, one of the uh, caretakers of the, of, the, um, that were, that, of the cemetery that were actually moving him that uh, parts of his body fell out of the coffin. And he remembered picking up his skull and putting it back in the coffin and he said that when he did, it rattled. There was something inside the skull that was rattling. Many years later, in fact, it was in the 20th century, some doctors came forward and said, you know, that could have been, that could have been a tumor because tumors don't degrade at the same, but first of all, the brain degrades very quickly and tumors do not degrade at the same rate. And in fact, they solidify. So they said it's possible that he had a brain tumor that caused his erratic behavior and his, his, uh, his hallucinations and everything while in the hospital. Uh, of course, that's only a theory also, not proven. So many of Poe's works were inspired by true events he came upon in magazines or newspapers that he was editing. Sensational murders and the latest scandals as well as historical events that he read about were incorporated in some of his stories. The ticking tomb is, is what this, this particular uh, gravesite is called. It's a mysterious gravesite in Landenburg, Pennsylvania, which is in Southern Chester County. It's said to be the inspiration for Poe's short story, The Telltale Heart. In 1760, when surveyors Charles Mason and Jeremiah Dixon, they were creating the famous Mason-Dixon line, they, uh, a small child, crawled into their tent and began to cry. To comfort the child, <clears throat> Mason showed him his prized pocket watch. According to the legend, the boy put the watch in his mouth and swallowed it. Now, this is, a, this is part of the story that I find hard to believe because first of all, I have several pocket watches and they would not fit in a child's mouth, much less be able to be swallowed. Uh, although I do have a very small pocket watch, <clears throat> a lady's pocket watch that possibly could do that, but I can't imagine this guy, if it was his, his favorite, most prized possession being that, that small. I, I'm, I'm thinking that this part of the story is unbelievable. Uh, they found the boy had wandered away from his parents who were happy to have him back, but they noticed this ticking coming from the watch in his stomach. The ticking continued throughout his life and legend says it can be heard today if you put your ear to the ground at his grave. I haven't done that myself. I intend to do it at some point. <laughs> Poe heard the story and it became the inspiration for The Telltale Heart. Another one of his short, uh, short stories was Berenice. This is a tale of a man so obsessed with his late wife's teeth that he digs her up, digs up her grave to retrieve them. He's so fixated on extracting her teeth that he fails to notice her screams. It turns out she was accidentally buried alive, which happened a lot back in those days. This story was probably inspired by a story that appeared in the Baltimore Saturday Visitor that Poe edited, grave robbers had been caught stealing teeth from corpses and selling them to make dentures. 
He also knew of stories of people being buried alive who had suffered from seizures and were quickly buried without being embalmed. The fall of the House of Usher. The name Usher itself was, was a, a, a name that was a family friend of his mother. Uh, the Ushers were actually also actors that traveled with, with uh, Poe's mother, Eliza. And uh, they, they in fact had the three kids right after Eliza's death. They took the three kids until they could be sent to different families. But in the story, Mad Roderick Usher disposes of his twin sister, Madeline, by entombing her alive in the cellar of their ancestral home. Poe's inspiration for the insane Usher twins may have been from the two real life Usher twins that he, he came to know, uh, James and Agnes. They were the children of Luke Noble Usher, an actor who performed with and was a close friend of his mother. In po as in Poe's story, the real Usher twins were said to be insane. Another story, the cask of Amontillado. Fortunato plays the, pays the ultimate price for insulting Montresor and ends up bricked up alive behind the catacomb wall. Poe likely based this story on an article he read in an issue of the Columbian magazine. Workmen there had discovered a skeleton in the wall of the church of St. Lorenzo. You've probably all heard the story of the pit and the pendulum. In the years prior to the writing of this short story, many reports of atrocities had been published regarding the Inquisition. The Inquisition ended when, French, when the French, led by General La Salle, entered Toledo, Spain. Poe's story had a torture chamber with moving walls, a swinging pendulum blade, and a bottomless pit. General La Salle described these types of instruments of torture he found in the palace of the Inquisition. In Poe's story, the narrator is rescued by none other than General La Salle. The Mask of the Red Death. In this story, a plague known as the Red Death is sweeping the land, causing the peasantry to bleed from their pores while suffering an agonizing death. To escape the fate of his subjects, Prince Prospero locks himself and his hand-picked noble friends in his elaborately decorated abbey for a masquerade ball. Late in the evening, an uninvited guest arrives. When Prospero tries to throw him out, blood begins to gush from Prospero's face, revealing that he too has been stricken with the Red Death. The other, guest, the, the other guest sees the intruder only to realize that there's really no one in the costume. Just 10 years prior to the writing of this story, a cholera pandemic started in India, spread to Europe, and then into the United States. In the midst of the pandemic, a group of 2,000 Parisians decided to celebrate what they believed was the end of the world by throwing a masquerade ball in the Theater de Variates. At the stroke of midnight, a guest arrived dressed as the personification of cholera, a skeleton with bloodshot eyes. An account of this bizarre party appeared in the New York Mirror and Poe read about it. The Mystery of Marie Roget, one of Poe's best known detective stories, host, boasts that it provides the solution to a real life unsolved mystery, the murder of Mary Cecilia Rogers. Miss, Miss Rogers' body was found floating in the Hudson River there were many suspects, but the police could not identify the murderer. A magazine, The Lady's Companion, was helping to raise funds for a reward for information leading to an arrest. Poe answered the challenge by selling his story to the magazine's owner. He promised to not only indicate the assassin in a manner which will give renewed impetus in the investigation, but also demonstrate a method of investigation that could be used by real life police departments in future cases. So in this particular case, he was actually offering what he believed was a, a method of, of uh, investigation the police could use. And, and he, became, he became one of the first people that, to actually be uh, considered a detective fiction writer. The Oblong Box. <clears throat> in this story, Mr. Wyatt travels by ship from Charleston to New York with his sisters a woman claiming to be his wife and a large oblong box. The ship goes down in a storm and Wyatt goes down with the ship and as well as the ob oblong box. A friend later discovers that the woman pretending to be Wyatt's wife was really a servant. His actual wife died before the journey and was being secretly transported in the box with preservative salt because the ship's crew was superstitious about having a corpse on board. 
Three years prior, newspapers around the country covered the sensational case of John C. Colt. Who, he was the brother of Samuel Colt of firearms fame. John Colt murdered the printer Samuel Adams. This is not the Samuel Adams of beer fame. Samuel Adams was a, was a, a printer uh, over an unpaid bill. He stuffed the body into a box of salt and attempted to have it shipped to New Orleans. Adams' friends alerted police when they discovered his absence. The ship was delayed in sailing and the box sat on the ship for 10 days. The ship was discovered when the crew in investigated a terrible stench aboard the ship. I don't know how many of you ever heard the story of the Poe Toaster. Beginning on his birth date in the year of, his, of the 100th anniversary of his death, so January 19th, 1949. At midnight, a mysterious stranger entered the cemetery dressed in black with a wide brimmed hat and white scarf. He poured a glass of cognac and raised the glass in a toast to Poe's memory. He then vanished into the night, leaving the partial bottle of cognac and three roses on Poe's grave. The tradition continued until 2009, the bicentennial year of Poe's birth. A note left on the gravesite by the Poe toaster in 1999 stated the original toaster had died and passed the tradition to a son. This is an actual photo that appeared in Life magazine taken by Bill Ballenberg of the Poe toaster at midnight at Poe's grave. Uh, it, it of course was, uh, <clears throat> it, it was one of the few ever taken. They, they didn't, they tried to keep people away once, this, once the Poe Toaster story got to be popular, they tried to give this guy enough privacy to allow him to do his thing without being caught or, or uh, harassed by the waiting public outside the gates. Elizabeth Barrett Browning wrote to Poe from her home in England telling him that the Raven created both a sensation and a fit of horror in her country. Charles Baudelaire, Baudelaire, the leading French poet, recognized Poe's innovative writing and devoted himself to translating Poe's work into French. Europeans regarded Poe as America's first internationally influential author. Alfred Lord Tennyson called Poe America's most original creative genius. I can never forget the impressions I felt in reading a story of his for the first time. I experienced the sensation of such intense horror that I dared neither look at anything he had written nor even utter his name. By degrees, this terror took the character of fascination. I devoured with a half reluctant and fearful avidity every line that fell from his pen. This was written by another poet at the time, Sarah Helen Whitman, no relation to Walt. In case I have piqued your interest in, in Poe, there are a number of things that you can go and, and see for yourself. Poe's birthplace marker in Boston, the Edgar Allan Poe Museum in Richmond, Virginia. It's a, it's a really great museum. We've been, my wife and I have been there. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe National Historic Site in Philadelphia, Edgar Allan Poe House and Museum in Baltimore, the Edgar Allan Poe Cottage in Bronx, in the Bronx, New York, the Church Home and Hospital in Baltimore, New, uh, Maryland, where he died, and Poe's gravesite, which is right next to that hospital also in Baltimore, Maryland. Words have no power to impress the mind without the exquisite horror of their reality. Edgar Allan Poe. I thank you. Questions? That was wonderful. That was thank really cool. Thank you. It's so funny when you start it, um, the first thing, one of the first sentences you said was that Poe has the habit of starting things he doesn't finish. Right. And it made me think, and I have my little notes here. I was writing a list mm -hmm. of the cities that claim Poe. And, you know, then it was the one at the end of your slides. Right, right. And I didn't actually know about the Boston one, but certainly I've been to Philadelphia and Baltimore and Richmond and and I uh, was unaware of the New York one, the cottage one as well, too. So oh. that's kind yeah, of everybody. Funny. Everybody he wants moves, a, piece, a piece of it. <laughs> right. And he moves around a lot. He can't finish he can't start in one place and finish in one place. He has right. to move all over. So it right. seems to be his. Uh, that's what he does. I uh, have a couple of questions. OK, let's see. 
Uh, whatever happened to his gambling debt? It doesn't sound like he had enough income to cover such a large debt. No, it, I've, I've never actually uh, read of anyone actually, certainly uh, Mr. Allen didn't pick up the debt and I don't believe anyone else did either. I don't think anyone of his associates was able to do that. He probably just stiffed them for the amount that he owed. Maybe that's why he moved around so much. It could be. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you think the rumor of cooping may be possibly what happened to Poe? I, I actually believe that's the case. It, it, everything that I've written, I mean, I've, I've read about <clears throat> points to the fact that he was, he was uh, in such a stupor, he was, he was probably beaten along with it, but he was in someone else's clothing. No one can understand how that would happen. Uh, and they weren't his, I mean, they certainly weren't uh, clothing that he traveled with. So I believe that that's probably the case that he was, he was probably uh, forced to go and vote in several locations. They probably plied him with liquor, which, which was really uh, a, a real problem for him because of the, of the uh, disease that he had. And he probably, uh, after a few drinks and a few probably being uncooperative with them, he probably took a beating and they left him in the street. So I, I do believe that's the case, yes. I don't believe the murder, I don't believe the murder theory of the father-in-law. <laughs> right. Um, here's a, just a comment. It's funny that Griswold thought he had the upper hand with a slanderous obit. And here we are, years... <sighs> Later. Years later, we remember Poe, but not Griswold. I'm honestly, fact, I've, ne I've never heard of Griswold. Who... No, and in fact, he didn't even use his own name in writing it. So, <laughs> oh, okay. it's kind of funny, isn't it? The years yeah. later, you know, yeah. what he thought. Um, where and how were Poe's stories usually first published? Example, like were they in magazines or books, and did they were they put together as collections? He he had he had two ways. He did he did take some of them and put them together as collections and sold them in, in book format very early in his career. But most of his writing actually was first published in magazines. And, and after he became more more popular, they were readily scooped up by by uh, national nationally recognized magazines and printed. It, it's odd for me to believe that the the Raven, which is is you know, like I say, it's my favorite and it's so well known across the world. That it sold for nine dollars <laughs> to a right. to a, a magazine, and the original magazine didn't even want it because they thought it was his plea for for help. Mm -hmm. And I, I just find that so odd. And and yet he became famous on that poem, right? Uh, among right. others, but that one was just certainly I I think his most famous. Well, I think especially as he uses different names throughout. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's confident, or he starts selling. He uses his own name. I just that's that's right. Yeah. Once he once he published his third book, then he started using his own name, and uh, <clears throat> and thereafter used it for his short stories, and uh, and like I, I I said in one of the earlier slides, he always lived off of his writing, but never very well. He even though he was selling a lot of poems and and short stories to magazines, he still didn't get a lot of money for them. I mean, this is the 1800s, so he. He wasn't, he wasn't getting a whole lot of money from them and he was, uh, he was eking out a living, but not a good one. Were there any Poe wannabes at the time? Actually his brother, his brother Henry, also uh, published several un under his own name. And he, um, it, it's actually felt though that when Henry struggled, Poe actually gave him a poem or two to, to publish in his name help out and and uh you know so that he would earn something from it also but yeah that his his brother they said his writing style i've never read anything by his brother but they said his writing style is a lot is a lot like pose but it would be if you were the if poe actually gave him his story, writing. So i'm not so sure about that <laughs> i guess that happens from time to time i guess <laughs> okay let's see here we have a couple people adding what their their favorite is okay let's hear it ruth says i like hop frog Okay, yeah. Uh, Pat says Annabelle Lee. Yeah. Carrie likes the Raven and Pit and the Pendulum. Right, yeah. I also commented that there is a cottage rented by Poe in the Bronx in New York. It was built in 1812. And she said as a child, her school would take them there as oh, a school trip. That's a great trip. <laughs> that is really neat. Uh, Sabrina asks, is there much speculation that Poe was psychic 
because of predicting the future with Richard Parker cannibalism. No, there, that was that. I don't. I don't think anyone ever explored that. But it, it, like I say, Ray Bradbury thought it was a great story, and it's his his favorite uh, tale of Poe. But I don't. I don't think there was anything psychic about it. Okay. Uh, here's another question. You mentioned that he had a medical condition that caused alcohol to put him into a stupor. Yeah. I wonder if, in addition to that, it happening often at that time in history, if it was also a source for his numerous stories about premature burials. Yeah. He so <clears throat> so they always said you know that he was an opium addict. Of course, that came from Griswold, but. They, they attributed a lot of his, his writing of this uh, psychological terror from the own, his own terror that he was going through in an, in an opium-addled condition, uh, which, which is possible, but it could also be from, from this alcohol uh, stupor or, or any of the maladies that, you know, that uh, can, can happen at the time. His, uh, he, was, he was prone to, to fevers and hallucinations. So a lot of these things, uh, could have contributed to his uh, his great stories. It is really fascinating, you know, just yeah. to, just the alcoholism to come up with these stories. But yeah. that's yeah. Mm. Uh, thank you for your time and expertise. Do you know if there is a specific time when Poe obtained significant notoriety? So it, yeah, and actually, it did happen during his his uh, own life. Uh, which is is odd because some people don't gain, gain that kind of notoriety until after death, but uh, near the end of his life, now he was he was still very young when he died, but he had he had become recognized uh, throughout Europe and and uh, in particular in in England, where they uh, they really believed that he was the best thing to have come out of the U.S. Even though uh, Longfellow and Emerson, you know, predated him. He uh, he. They felt that he was he was actually a, a better writer than than uh, those two. So yeah, he he did gain some notoriety, although not not the money that usually goes along with it. Okay. But he did gain notoriety even during his own life. It's like he's more famous now, though, probably. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Every school kid gets to, uh, like I said, I, I I was introduced in, I think it was in eighth grade, <clears throat> and. Uh, a lot of the, a lot of my fellow students thought, "Oh my God, we have to read this crap," and I loved it and and loved it, love it to this day. Well, my eighth grade teacher, we had to memorize Annabelle Lee. Okay, yeah. We had to memorize it, so yeah. I can still do pretty good, but I might need a little bit of cheats, a little, little couple sentences here and there. Yeah. yeah. Okay, this is this is a good one. Now I'm going to mess this up because I haven't heard of this one. Metzen Gerstein is my favorite story. It's overlooked. Highly recommend looking it up. That's I, I don't. Yeah, I, I don't know that one. I don't I, know I, that I, one either. Hmm. I will look it up as soon as I'm off this. Uh, <laughs> we are. Off this. I'll, come, I'll, I'll make sure we have the proper spelling. <laughs> uh, my first lasting experience with Poe is a telltale heart. Yeah. Made a huge impression on me at a very young age, and it has been with me thirty plus years later. Sure. Yeah, uh, me too. And 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 now that you understand where the inspiration came from, the ticking watch in some child's stomach. <laughs> I wrote that down too. You know, you can you know, you have, since you haven't been to Baltimore, you can I, go, I've got to stop Landon, there on the way down. Landenburg, Chester County is right on the way south, so you yep, can. I'm, I'm going to stop there too. <laughs> go listen at the grave. That's for sure. Uh, I'd have to say my my favorite one is the the cast of Amontillado. Oh yeah, yeah. I love that one. That was probably one of the first ones that we read as well when I was. Did you love the story or the wine? <laughs> Both now. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Let's see if there's any more questions. Yep, a couple more. Uh, what was the medical condition that caused his reaction to alcohol? Yeah, was I, I, I don't know the name of it, but uh, it is it is published. I just, uh, I didn't write it down, but I, there is a, uh, there is a name for it, and it's. It, I believe some people say it's caused by a particular gene that uh, that causes the the quick um, response to alcohol when in the system. I but I I don't remember the name of it. I'm sorry. That's interesting. You can look it up. It's it's available. Uh, was Poe ever accused of being an opio opioid addict before Griswold's obituary? He he was a lot of uh, <clears throat> so. He was very critical of his fellow writers, and a lot of them put, took pot shots at him 
<clears throat> when he was when he offered criticism of their work, they would they would shoot back and say, "Well, this is coming from a guy who's who's an opium addict, or this is from a drunk, or this is from a you know a drunken womanizer." So they always tried to put him down because of his own his own background, and they didn't really like to be called out on their own shortcomings. I'd be very curious if Griswold wrote his own obituary. So yeah. else yeah. for him. <laughs> ahead of time, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is all pre-planned. I don't need anyone else writing this for me, like what he did to the book. Yeah. Um, oh, this is Sabrina again regarding the uh, earlier story that we had never heard of. Mm -hmm. She's probably laughing at me the way I'm saying it. Metzger, Metzengerstein, Metzengerstein. It says a, a ghost horse brings villainous European aristocrat to a violent, fiery death. Mm. We'll have to read that one for sure. Thank you for bringing sounds, that to attention. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, do you have a suggestion of a collection of Poe's work to introduce someone to? Yeah, there's a. <clears throat> actually, you can you can go on uh, Amazon if you if you'd like. There are many collections. There's one, there's one that's simply titled Poems, but, but it's, not the, it's not the original book that he wrote called Poems. It's just a collection of poems. There's also one that's the, the complete works of Edgar Allan Poe, which has all of his poetry as well as his short stories. And the, the one, I'm not sure if the whole novel of uh, Arthur Gordon Pym is in that one, but, but it uh, certainly is an ex excerpt from it. But yeah, there are, if you go on Amazon, there's a lot of, a lot of good ones there. Um, somebody was also commenting on the story that we've not heard. I uh, have not read it, but the book is is in the library. Okay. You can check it out at the library. Yeah. And Amazon has it as well, too. Okay, very good. Let's see, is there any other questions that I missed? It looks like we've got them all here as I'm going through. If anybody else has any other questions, we're happy to take them. Just want to review it. I don't want anyone to miss out here. It says, uh, this lecture is uh, going to make me reread Poe. Yeah, I hope so. I You're hope right. So. Yeah, well, now everyone's going to be running to the library. So if you want to put it down, better put I'll, a reserve also, on it now. In, in closing, I'd also like to say that if you go on, on your uh, internet and look up under YouTube, Go to Edgar Allan Poe, The Raven, and, and there are three YouTube videos that you might like. The first one is, is a narration of the poem and, and the words appear on your screen so you can follow along at the same time. And it's by Christopher Lee. Christopher Lee is, of course, an English actor. Died recently right. within the last few years, but right. Christopher Lee had this very distinctive uh, voice, especially when, when, it's, uh, when you're thinking about Edgar Allan Poe. And there's another one by James Earl Jones. It's a couple minutes shorter, and it doesn't actually have the words on the screen. But if you just just sit back with your eyes closed and listen to James Earl Jones cite the Raven, oh, uh, it is it's fantastic. You gotta you gotta at least do yourself a favor and go check those two out. That's there's, really neat. There's a third one also, but those are my two favorites. Yeah, and there's lots of things on YouTube, short videos, and you know, introduction. I think even. Um, like TED Eds have things that kids can watch, you know, introducing them to Poe, things right. like that. So wonderful. Good. Well, thank you. thank you again so much for, for joining us and for all your research and inspiring us to go out and reread Poe and explore some new stories that we haven't heard of before. So, so on Halloween night, you have to do the Raven with Christopher Lee. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I thought you were going to say the cognac or something. I wasn't sure. Oh, well, that's on his birthday. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> and and the, so that one, that one shot that I had there of the grave with the three, it was a drawing of the three roses and mm -hmm. the bottle of half, 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 yeah, half drunk uh, cognac. It was, that was, I think, Hennessy cognac. That's not what the Poe toaster brought. He brought a $190 bottle of of Martell's cognac every year. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and the three roses were laid in a very specific way so that no one else would be able to duplicate it. So, you know, if there was, if there was someone else that tried to sneak in and, and uh, duplicate this, they would know it was a fake. The three, the three roses were supposedly for himself, 
his his wife and her mother, his aunt, that uh, in recognition of those three people. So that's another story. If if you'd really like to read about the Poe toaster, that's fascinating. <laughs> so. I love that there is such a mystery recent yeah. times. You know the way there's cameras everywhere and cell phones and social media. You know yeah. all that, but. I love that that was being, that was able to be pulled off. Yeah, the, the Baltimore Historical Society even tried to resurrect the toaster after he no longer appeared. And they, they had a contest. They accepted uh, applications for people to come in and, and show their ability to be the toaster. And they, they chose one. And of course, they never let anyone know who it was. Who it was. And I think it had been either, either 2018 or 2019, they, they did a, a run of this guy <clears throat> and, and there were plenty of cameras and plenty of people watching outside the gates of the cemetery. But in, in 2020, then it stopped because of the, or two, 2021, it stopped because of the pandemic and, uh, and it hasn't been done since. But, but they, uh, like I say, the S Historical Society tried to resurrect it and they weren't that successful. Right. <laughs> Unlike yours, I mean, your Historical Society would have pulled it off. Absolutely. Absolutely. No problem there. <laughs> All right. Very good. Well, on that note, thank you again so much for sharing your, your interest with us. And we, we really appreciate your dedication and you volunteering your time, not only with all the research that you've done, but to share it with us this evening. Happy to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great night, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.